right, guys, turn in your Bibles to fir- uh, <coughs> I about to say 1 Corinthians. I meant Colossians, the first chapter. I'll get things right in a minute. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians, the first chapter. We'll be looking at verses 15 through 20 today. We are nearing the most beautiful time of year for many people. A time to remember peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And in Colossians, the first chapter, Paul is very much proclaiming the very meaning, the very reason we celebrate Christmas. Because of the superiority and the supremacy of our Christ. Let's read together in Colossians 1, 15 to 20 and talk about this incomparable Christ to whom we assemble and praise every Lord's day. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in which in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now, some people may have problems understanding what this means. This is the very heart of the gospel being proclaimed by Paul. And he is saying straight out, there is nothing we can do to get to heaven. God has done it all. But what we need to be able to do to get to heaven It's found through Christ alone. Now I'm going to break it down little bit by little bit. We're going to start in verse 15. We're going to work ourselves right on down. And we're going to talk about what each one of those are and why it's so important. What we're going to talk about is the supremacy of Christ and why Christ is so important in our beliefs, in our followings, and in our lives. Why does Jesus need to be first in all things? Before you leave here today, I hope you have the answer to that. If you don't, I'm going to do my very best to get this sermon posted on YouTube so you can watch it again. Because I want to get this word out there. Why do we worship Christ? This is why. First, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now, there's a lot of people that say that you can't prove God exists, that God isn't real, you can't see Him, then they haven't studied their history books too well. Because Jesus was very much real and walked among men. Well, you can say Jesus was God, but was He? Well, let's look at Scripture, shall we? Let's look and see what Jesus has to say about Himself in John 14, verses 8 and 9. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How how can you say, show us the Father? Or what about in Hebrews 1, 3, where the writer of Hebrews writes, He is the reflection of God's glory and the impact, the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. He is the exact imprint of God. In Christ, the invisible God became visible. We need to consider why this is so great. 
As we've already noted, Jesus is our opportunity to see God. God was one of us, a human who walked on earth. Through Jesus, we see the Lord. And I want us to know God and learn about Jesus. And if you want to know about God, then all you do have to do is look to Jesus and his word. The point goes so much further, though. You see, some people will go and say, well, Jesus couldn't be God. It contradicts what's said in the Old Testament. Let's read, shall we? Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 through 6. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make of yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down before them and serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The people were not to have any images any engraven images, no representations of God, no images of things in heaven or on earth, no images that can properly reflect or express the image of God. Minus one. One that was created in the very image of God. And not just the image of God. God incarnate. You see, God is a jealous God. He doesn't want any engraven images. He don't want any kind of falsehoods. So he brought the real thing to earth, as he said he would do. He mentions throughout the Old Testament of the one who is to come that would be called the Messiah. He mentions even in David's Psalms the one who was to come. He mentions in Isaiah the one who will be born of a virgin. We get to talking about that. No one, everyone gets upset about Christmas in, in, some, in so many congregations. They think that we shouldn't celebrate Christmas. I hate that idea. And we shouldn't celebrate Christmas. I don't care what time of year it is. I don't care if it's in December. I don't care if it's in June. I don't care if it's in July. I don't care what day of the year or day, month, time, year it is. Christmas should be an everyday thing. We should be giving thanks to the birth of Jesus Christ, don't you think? I think we should be thankful for the birth of Jesus Christ because if Jesus wasn't born, guess what? We wouldn't be here, would we? We sure wouldn't be assembling together as like precious faith if Jesus didn't come down here and celebrate with us and become one of us. No. So yes, I am all for celebrating Christmas. And there could be people that say, well, you're preaching damnation to your congregation. I look right at them and I say, no more than living in the works of men get you into heaven. I'm here to tell you today, you can celebrate Christmas. As long as you don't make Christmas into something that it isn't. The assembling of the saints, the worship of Christ, the remembrance of truth, that that babe came down here on that night in Bethlehem for one reason, and it's why we come around this Lord's Supper table every Lord's Day. We remember that. If we can't celebrate Christmas, then we shouldn't celebrate Easter either or any other times that Jesus celebrated. But I'm going to tell you right now, we should celebrate Jesus every single day of our life. Why? Because he is the very image of God. Not made by hands of men. Not carved out of stone, not carved out of some... some, uh, some a rare metal, not painted on a tapestry. No. The image of God was carved in flesh and bone and had blood flowing in him and was created for you and me. His name is Jesus. Nothing, and I mean nothing else, comes close. No one else comes close. Only Jesus appropriately reflects the character and the divine nature of God. 
It also mentions in here, just as I talked about the celebration of Christmas, we all know those words, the firstborn of all creation. We read those in, in the book of Luke. We talk about the firstborn, the one who is to come, the firstborn of the, the, the Lord's one and only. And some people falsely take that to mean that Paul is saying that Jesus is a created being. Not so. Firstborn can have that meaning. However, firstborn is also used in Scripture to refer to being supreme over something. Notice the usage in the Scriptures. You go back to the book of Psalms. As I said, Psalms mentions the one who would come. In Psalm 89, 27, it says, And I will appoint him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. Who do you think that's talking about? They're not talking about some ripoff Jesus. They're not talking about some fake Messiah. They're talking about the real thing. The point is that Paul is making the same connection in verse 15. The firstborn means he is supreme over all other kings of the earth. Christ is supreme over all creation. Paul is distinguishing Christ from created things. He outranks everything in creation. We know that this is right in understanding because of what Paul says in verse 16. Look at what that says. Christ is firstborn over all creation because by him everything was created. All things were created. Christ is supreme over all creation because all things were created by him. There is nothing created that Christ was not involved with in creating. There is nothing, whether in heaven, on earth, things that are invisible or visible. Everything, even the angels and spiritual beings themselves, were created by Christ, and there is none greater. Scholars note that there are four descriptions. You might look in here and see what these verses are right here, that they, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Do you notice those four things that are mentioned right there in verse 16? Those four things that are mentioned right there in that? These were Jewish terms used for various rankings of angels. Angels are created by Christ. And whether that is by the throne, dominion, ruler, or authorities of those angels, God, Christ, our Lord, is above all of those. Christ is superior to all things in every way because he created them. And if you don't believe me, all you got to do is go back to Genesis chapter 1. Ain't that right, Tarpon? You go back there to Genesis chapter 1 and you read what it says right there. It says, let us make man in our image. He wasn't talking to the angels. You see, God and Jesus were there together, making us in His image. Paul goes further at the end of verse 16, declaring that not only have all things been created through Christ, but all things were created for Christ. Jesus is the goal of all creation. Everything exists to display Christ's glory. And ultimately, he will be glorified in his creation. Creation is to praise and honor Jesus Christ. Yes, even the rocks will praise God. The rocks, the stones, the valleys, the grass in the field, the birds in the air, all the animals and creatures in nature and us. I don't believe in Christ. Oh. But that's the good thing. Because eventually you will know Christ. I hope it is a good thing. I really do. I hope you get to know Christ now before it's too late. If you don't know Christ now, the book of Philippians chapter 2 says, Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you don't know him as your Lord now, when you die, you will know him. You will know him as Lord. Not your Savior. But you will know he is Lord. 
and there will be a day of weeping and gnashing of teeth if you don't know it. You see, it is through Christ we have sustenance. He is able to sustain us eternally because of that greatness, because he was before all things. Because he existed before creation. He existed before anything else. Christ is before all things in terms of time. He is eternal. He has no beginning because he was there before everything. Not only is Christ eternal, but he holds all creation together. He keeps the cosmos from being chaotic. Christ sustains his creation. This is an important doctrine. Christ did not create the world and leave it. There's a lot of people. There's a whole lot of people that think God just left us spinning here. That God just went and created the world and left. And didn't see nothing of him afterward. There are many different cultures and civilizations that do believe in such tripe. No, we have a God who loves us and sustains us. He takes care of us. He didn't walk away once things got started. Christ is very much involved in his creation. So much so that he is the head of the body. Paul tells us that Jesus is the head of the body. When referring to the body, Paul means the church. Paul means the church. It's important to take just a moment to define what he means by the term church. Unfortunately, religion has developed a concept of the church that is anything but biblical. Many take the church to be some sort of institution some sort of hierarchy that is led by Christ as our CEO. The church ain't a business. And if you're running it like a business, stop. Christ wants his church to be heard and be seen and be alive and active and breathing just as a body should be, not as a building. I'm here to tell you today, this is not the church. The building is not the church. That's a plank of wood. The building is not the church. See this? The pulpit is not the church. The pulpit is a place to stand and hear God's word being proclaimed. It should not be idolized. It should not be lifted up. It should not be raised on some kind of pedestal. No. That is a plank of wood and the man who stands behind it, whether it be the song leader, whether it be the one offering blessing for the Lord's Supper, whether it be the one preaching and teaching, whoever it is, they are a fallible human being. Yes, that is what I'm getting at. That wood ain't going to get you anywhere. That wood on the building ain't going to get you anywhere. Let me show you something else here. I'll put this out here and let everybody see it at home. There we go. I want to show you something else. See this right here? That ain't the church either. That ain't the church either. All that is is a pew. That pew ain't going to get you anywhere. You can sit in that pew all day long. You can sit here until the cows are home, but it ain't going to get you to heaven because it's not the church. You want to know what the church is? That's the church. That flesh and bone, I promise I won't hit you. You're the church. Amen. You're the church. Is Helen, you the church. I tell you, Lonnie and Gloretta, you're the church. You heathens over here. <laughs> I love you. And you are the church, aren't you? Well, say it. Amen. Amen. We the church. That's what this is about, everybody in here, the flesh, the blood, the bone. We, we are the church. You that are watching, you're part of the church, you're part of the body. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you, you are part of the body of Christ. <laughs> Do you see how important that is? Sometimes... The scriptures speak of the church as followers, all followers who have ever lived. 
Sometimes it talks about the individual people, such as the church at Colossae or the church universal, us. You see, wherever Christians gather together, the church assembles. Paul says that Jesus is the head of the church, the body of Christ. He simply means that Jesus is in charge of our lives. He guides and governs his followers. We are not in charge. We are not the head. Christ is the head. Christ is in charge. It's very simple and yet so important. I want to ask you folks, what would you do if you didn't have a head? What would it be like if you didn't have a head? This is why it's so important for us to understand. You realize, let's go from here up and have a look at ourselves. From here up, from neck up, why is a head so important? Well, first off, let's go with what we see. Ah, in order to see, you have to have eyes, don't you? That's on your head. If you didn't have your head, you wouldn't have your eyes. Guess what else you wouldn't have? You wouldn't have your ears either. You wouldn't be able to hear anything, would you? You wouldn't be able to smell anything much either, would you, if you didn't have a head, because your nose would be gone. You wouldn't be able to taste anything. You wouldn't be able to eat anything. You know, your hands are going every which way. They ain't going to be able to know where to put food in. Oh, but then there is that other thing, isn't it? The thing you can't see. Your brain. That's what's important, isn't it? Because without the brain, you can't see, you can't hear, you can't smell, you can't taste, you can't swallow, you can't do anything. Your body can't function without your brain. No. You can keep tissue alive with a pump, but you can't keep it alive and functioning properly and living without a brain. And that is why Jesus is important. And this is the critical point that Paul is making right here. We are incomplete without Jesus. Just like we would be incomplete without a head. If we didn't have our head, we wouldn't be able to exist. We can't exist without Jesus. We have to stop and think that we are not the head here. That he is the head. He is the one that needs to be in charge, not us. We follow direction. We serve the head. The body does what the head says. And Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. As we pointed out before, that term firstborn means a broader meaning. It has a broader sense than just being first. Jesus was not the first person to raise, be raised from the dead. You know how I know that? We see Elisha miraculously raising a child from the dead, don't we? You know, you go back in the Old Testament, he raised, yeah, Elisha raised up a child from the dead, resurrected, right? Now, that was in a period of time where there was a need for a, a lesson in that. And they still didn't believe that lesson. Yeah, they raised a child from the dead. In fact, you go into the New Testament, you see what Jesus did. Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. There's one difference, though, between what happened to them, the one that happened in the Old Testament, and Jesus. You know, I know what happened? You want to know what the difference is? The child, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, all died again. They all died again. But do you know who didn't? Jesus. Jesus is the only one in human creation, in all of human time, to go, die, be buried, resurrect, and not return to the grave. He's the only one to do that. 
He's the only one to do that. Jesus was the first person to raise from the dead and never die again. It is the implication of the resurrection. That is the point that Paul is making. Christ is supreme because of his resurrection from the dead, never to die again. Christ is preeminent in rank because of the resurrection. Notice that this is the point of verse 18. In being the firstborn from the dead, that means that he might come to have first place in everything. In every nook, every cranny, every facet of our life, Jesus should have first place. The resurrection shows that he is supreme in all things. Earlier we noted that Christ is supreme over creation because he created all things. Paul continues to speak about the supremacy of Christ, noting that the resurrection proves that he is to have first place in everything. Christ is to have first place in our families. He is to have first place in our marriages. He is to have first place in our jobs and our careers. He is to have first place in our time. He is to have first place in our hearts. He is to have first place in our worship. Christ is to have first place in our love. You name it, Christ is to have first place in it. In everything we do, in every action, every reaction we have, Christ needs to be first. We must also be able to to be, have him first in everything that we do. Why does the resurrection from the dead give Christ supremacy in all things? Because raising from the dead never to die again proves one major point, who you are. Christ is God. He is one with God. It proves the next point that Paul describes concerning Jesus, that he, in verse 19, is divine. In Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The simple point is that Jesus is divine. Everything that makes God who God is dwelled in Jesus. Jesus is God. The full nature of God is in Christ. Christ is the full embodiment of the Lord. And we can't emphasize that enough. In verse 20, we see one more picture. Paul has spent all this time praising the greatness of Christ. The greatness and supremacy has been tangible and is a tangible benefit in our lives. Jesus has the right authority and power to reconcile. Everything is reconciled to Jesus. For there is to be reconciliation. In order for there to be reconciliation, it means that something has gone wrong. Well, it has. We as humans have gone wrong. Every single one of us. We don't need to reconcile with one unless something's wrong and something's gone terribly wrong. Sin is in the world and changed everything. Sin has changed the creation. It has turned the creation against the creator. It has destroyed the relationship with God that we had. We can't have a relationship with God because of our sins. We have made this relationship go bad. Our sins have severed our relationship with our God. Remember what we've learned. Christ is the head. And if he is the head, he is the ruler, and he is in charge over all creation and rules over all creation, Christ is to be first place in everything and first place in our lives. Why is that important to redemption and reconciliation? Why is that so important? You see, if we go and say God is not first in our lives, it severs a relationship with him. But if Christ comes in and offers peace to us, since he is God, he can reconcile the relationship between God and man. And he does this through the blood of his death on the cross. Paul is going to explore this further as we continue in this chapter. Next week we'll be talking about that. But I want us to think about this today. 
Christ is supreme and his and, and his you and his and has used his supremacy. Christ is supreme and has used his supremacy to make peace between us and God. We deserve God's wrath, not his mercy. Christ made peace through his death. Told you y'all were going to get the answer to that question, didn't I? Why is Jesus so great? Why do we follow him? Why do we worship him? I think I've made that point clear. But let me remind you, so you can take these notes home with you and share them with your friends and your family, especially at this time of year. First, when you know Jesus, then you know God. When you see Jesus, then you have seen the invisible God. If you do not know Jesus, then you don't know God. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't have a relationship with God. You might claim you do. You might sit in the pews. You might sit in a building somewhere. You might listen to a message, but unless you have a relationship with Jesus, you ain't got a relationship with God. Second, Jesus is the head of the first place, is head and has first place in everything. He is the head and is first place in everything. He's the head of the church and has first place in every single thing that we do. Jesus must have first place in everything in your life. He created you and he must be first. And finally, we come to God through Jesus who reconciled us. Jesus is great because he made peace between God and us. Jesus brings us near to God. Jesus made a relationship with the Lord possible. Take note of those things and take them and share them with those who need to hear it. There are people in this world that will tell you, you cannot see God. I am here today to tell you this world has already seen God and he came in the form of a man named Jesus. This morning, that name is being called out all across this great country and all across this world by people for the very first time. People needing to know the love and the supremacy of Jesus. The gospel is being proclaimed, and people are reacting to it, just as they did in the old days in the book of Acts. What must we do to be saved, they said. Peter told them, repent, and each of you be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus said it himself, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He does not believe will be condemned. Well, you got to believe in. Well, you got to believe that Jesus is Lord. Not just your Savior, you got to believe he's Lord. You got to believe that you need to change your life. How do you do that? What Peter said, you repent. Repent of who you were to be who you need to be in God and who God can make you to be by putting your trust in his will and allowing him to change you, turning away from sin and back to the cross. Put your sin at the foot of the cross and give it to Jesus. To confess that Jesus Christ is not just your Savior, but your Lord, the very one who can give you hope the very one who can give you salvation, the very one who can give you a relationship back with God. And be baptized. That means to be immersed, plunged underneath water, and raised up in the newness of life. Well, can't I just get baptized and call it done? No. Baptism only don't save you. Believing only don't save you. None of that stuff saves you. What saves you is God. God's plan is how you come to him. Believe in Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Confess Jesus as the son of the living God, your Lord and your Savior. And to be baptized. Not because the water does anything special, but that, that's how God says you are to do it. Just as he raised Christ up from the dead, so too he raises you up in baptism. We'll be studying that in Colossians 2 very soon.